the locus of power has been steadily shifting from New Delhi to the state capitals. This decentralization of power will not stop at the state capitals. It has to be further decentralized and it is being further decentralized to the level of the districts and eventually down to the level of the taluka and the village. In other words, the kind of federal system that our constitution had envisaged is changing at a very, very rapid pace. The second big trend is that the importance of the state is going down to the advantage of civil society. I think the exercise of democracy itself, of adult franchise, has been able to give our citizens a greater and greater degree of confidence to question the state, to interrogate the state, to doubt the state. This is a trend which is bound to grow in the years to come. The third major shift is again a change uh, of authority from the government to the market. Economic reforms have now made it entirely possible for people to depend less and less on government. Government still retains a huge amount of power to distribute and allocate natural resources, but it is the forces of the market that are beginning to assert themselves. The fourth trend is that in this caste-based society, the dominance of the upper castes is eroding very, very rapidly in favor of those who are down below the social ladder. This has been happening since the mid-60s. It has accelerated since. And entire communities who had virtually no role to play, particularly in political life, today are asserting themselves in a way which is quite unprecedented. The fifth change is that this nation is witnessing a swift change again from what I would like to call old India or gerontocratic India to a young India. I think we should remind ourselves from time to time that we are perhaps the youngest nation in the world. Close to 80% of our population is less than 35 years old. This great demographic dividend will be with us for only for another 20, 22 years. And therefore we have a window of opportunity for the next two decades to transform this country completely. Yet another major shift is that a male-dominated state and a male-dominated society is now under severe stress. What all of us have witnessed since that gruesome and heinous rape and death of the 23-year-old woman in Delhi teaches us is that even when young people come out, they may not have read all the leftist literature of the past as we do. They may have no proper ideological direction, but make no mistake, the Indian male is under threat. The Indian male's domination of all levers of power, economic, political, social, and I dare say even cultural, this is under threat, and that change is something which is going to bring about a tremendous revolution in this country over the next two decades. Apart from these changes, in a broader sense, there are three others which I think merit attention. One is that we were, after independence, an inward-looking country. We were afraid of foreign influences. In the name of Swadeshi, we didn't allow either our goods to be sold abroad or our minds to be exposed to the outside world. Today, India is one of the most outward-looking countries that you can think of. And that outwardness is to be found in the extraordinary spread of the internet because everyone today has access 
to anything, just about anything happening in the world at large. An inward looking country has become, and will become even more so in the future, an outward looking country. We were also, after independence, terribly afraid of technology. I can give you two examples. One was when Rajiv Gandhi asked Vasan Sati, who was then the information and broadcasting minister, to introduce color television. There were massive protests in parliament and outside parliament saying, how can a poor country afford color television? But Rajiv Gandhi went ahead <clears throat> and of course today no one ever wants to think of those protests. Similarly, when a suggestion was made to computerize a certain number of activities of the railway ministry, the railway ministry bureaucrats and the minister made life extremely difficult. In fact, in certain railway stations in the country, vehicles were vandalized. But today, there is no such thing. Today, the demand everywhere is for a laptop. It is for communication. It is to be exposed to the outside world. And this is important simply because for the first time in the living memory of India, there is no distinction between urban and rural as far as exposure to the outside world is concerned. Whether it's a village or a city, everyone is watching the same soaps, the same serials, the same programs, and therefore, this kind of dichotomy that you hear, a leader of one organization who I shall not name, was quoted two days ago as saying that rapes happen only in India, they don't happen in Bharat. This is a way of thinking which is completely contrary A, to facts, that's simply not true, but also it denotes a mentality where anything that is progressive, forward-looking, which challenges the system, is dubbed to be against tradition. This is changing, and this will change more and more. The way we have embraced the outside world, and I'm particularly delighted that the reverse is equally true. A lot of our young people who left us to seek better pastures, greener pastures abroad, have still wanted to retain their, their roots here. And I'm delighted that people like Bhagavad Chitra have set an example of this direction. This is going to happen more and more. The final change, ladies and gentlemen, is the kind of change which we celebrated today by awarding these people. Each one of them has done something to change our mind. They may not have started big industries and given jobs, but they have started a new way of telling us to think, to feel, to be sensitive. And people like this are to be found across our land. I am going very soon to Gauhati, to Assam, because not too many people know that there is a literary festival held in Assam every year, which brings together 200,000 people for four days. And there again, it is writers, it is thinkers who are awarded in the Assamese language. You have similar cases elsewhere in the country. So when I was asked by Mr. Bang what I thought about current chaos, I said, I don't know what to tell you. But what gives me room for optimism is that big change, even revolutionary change, <coughs> is taking place in our country. And of course, every change has its good sides and its bad sides. Economic reforms has done wonders for our country. No one can dispute that. But economic reforms have also meant growing disparities between social classes and regions. Economic reforms have also meant environmental degradation. So there's the good and the bad of it. And similarly, this extraordinary spread of communications has meant access to the outside world, access to 
sources of knowledge, but it's also meant access to some of the most dangerous and criminal things that you can find on the net. But I think we should trust our young people to finally strike the middle path. And we should trust them because somewhere down the line, every young person I know is aware of how far, as the French say, of how far to go too far. And therefore, I close by saying that the examples that the individuals we've honored this evening have set need to be known much beyond this hall. And I quite agree with what Adil Kogadis just said. We are constantly preaching to the converted. We need now to go out and first and foremost understand what is happening. The gentleman who spoke of India and Bharat does not understand. The gentleman, a minister in Madhya Pradesh, who said women should be called the Lakshman Rekha, does not understand. Who does that Lakshman Rekha? A minister in Karnatak, or rather in Andhra Pradesh, who said India might have caught freedom at midnight, but girls should not wander at midnight. On what ground, on what authority does he say that? So everywhere I think newer questions are coming up, newer issues are rising. But if you take a look really even at the big picture, and this is where I would disagree with Atul, even at the macro level, I am far, far more optimistic today than I was five years ago. Because the trends and processes as I analyze them are going in favor of a more decentralized India, of a more vibrant, democratically vibrant India, of an entrepreneurial India, of an India where the young are asserting themselves, of an India where women are asserting themselves, and I think a combination of these political, social, economic, and above all, cultural elements that are present everywhere, despite the chaos, these are going to show us the way out. And in that, I do hope that Maharashtra Foundation, like the Sadhana Trust, keeps a track of how these various trends are emerging in a state like Maharashtra. And I will end with that because after spending a great deal of time outside of Pune and Maharashtra, more than four decades, I have returned to Pune 14 months ago. And I've been one of those who have been involved in a new venture here called the Pune International Center. I've done it along with several people, but particularly two, Dr. Vijay Kehrkar and Dr. Raghunath Mashankar. And the aim here is precisely to now link up with organizations like Sadhana to do something which only Maharashtra can do because of the track record of Maharashtra in terms of promoting social reform, in terms of promoting political liberalism, in terms of promoting an economy that takes into account also the need for including those who have been outside the range of the market. It's in Maharashtra again where you have people who are acutely aware of environmental hazards of this kind of development. And therefore, it used to be said one time that when Bengal uh, sneezes, India catches a cold. I would like to end by saying, whenever a lamp is lit in Maharashtra, it's all of India that gets enlightened. Thank you.